I, I, in all of my pastorates, I can only remember, now there could have been others without my knowing it, but I remember one person who ever owned one of those 1901 American uh, standards. So, back in the, oh, when was it, 1956-57, Mr. F. Dewey Lockman of the Lockman Foundation, one of the dearest friends we've ever had for 25 years, big man, some 300 pounds, snow white hair, one of the most terrific businessmen I've ever met. Always said he was like Nehemiah. He was building a wall, and you couldn't get in his way. When he had got his mind on something, he went right to it. Couldn't be daunted. Never saw anything like it. Most unusual men. Very unusual. Spent weeks and weeks and weeks in their home. Real close friends of the family. Well, he, he discovered that the copyright was just as loose as a fumbled ball on a football field. Nobody wanted it. The publishers didn't want it. Who wanted it? Nobody wanted it. Didn't get anywhere. Mr. Lockman got in touch with me and said, uh, would, would you and Ann come out and, and spend some weeks with us and we'll work on a feasibility report. I, I can pick up the copyright to the 1901 if it seems advisable. Well, up till that time, I thought the West Cotton Heart was the text. You, you were, you're intelligent if you believed in the West Cotton Heart. Some of the finest people in the world believe in, in that Greek text. The finest leaders we have today. You'd be surprised. If I told you, you wouldn't believe it. They haven't gone into it just as I hadn't gone into it, just taking for granted. But at any rate, we went out. We started on a feasibility report, and I encouraged him to go ahead with it. I'm afraid I'm in trouble with the Lord. I encouraged him to go ahead with it. We, we, we laid the groundwork. I wrote the format. I, I helped to interview some of the translators. I sat with the translators. I wrote the preface. When you see the New American Standard, they're my words. Well, when I got my copy, I got one of the 50 deluxe copies that were printed. Mine was number seven. Blue, light blue cover. But it was a big, rather big, and I couldn't carry it with me. And I, I never really looked at it. I just took for granted it was done as we started it, you know. Until some of my friends across the country began to learned that I had some part in it, and they started saying, what about this? What about this? Especially Dr. David Otis Fuller in Grand Rapids. I've known him for 35 years, and he'd say, he always called me Frank, I called him Duke. He said, Frank, what about this? You had part in it. What, what about this? What about this? Well, first, and I thought, no, wait a minute. Let's don't go overboard. Let's don't be too crazy. You know how you justify yourself the last minute? I got to the place, I said to Ann, I'm in trouble. I can't refute these arguments. They're, it's wrong. It's terribly wrong. It is frightfully wrong. And what am I going to do about it? Well, I went through heart search, uh, some real soul searching for about four months. I don't know. I think about four months. And I sat down and wrote the most difficult letter of my life, I think. And I wrote to my friend Dewey, and I said, Dewey, I don't want to add to your problems. Lost his wife some three years ago. I was there for the funeral. The uh, doctor made a mistake in operating on a cataract. He lost the sight of one eye and then had to have an operation on the other. Had a slight heart attack, had sugar diabetes, man 74 years of age. But I wrote and said, I can no longer ignore these criticisms I'm hearing, and I can't refute them. The only thing I can do, and dear brother, I have nothing against you, and I can witness at the judgment seat of Christ and before men were ever ago, that you were 100% sincere. He's not a translator. He's not, he's not schooled in language or anything. He's just a businessman. He did the promoting. He had the money. He did the promoting. So I, I said, he did it conscientiously. He wanted absolutely right. He thought it was right. I guess nobody pointed out some of these things to him when it was finished. But nevertheless, I said, I must, under God, renounce every attachment to the New American Standard. I have the copy of the letter. In fact, I have his letter. Showed it to some people. The Roberts saw it. Mike saw it, stating that he was bowled over, that he was shocked beyond words. He said, that's putting it mildly, but he said, I'll write you in a few weeks. And I still love you. To me, you're going to be Franklin, my friend, throughout the course. And he said, I'll write you in three weeks. But he won't write me now. He was to be married, sent us an invitation to come to the reception standing in the courtroom, I mean, in the county court, by the desk, the clerk said, what is your full name, sir? And he said, Franklin Dewey. And that's the last word he spoke on this earth. 
So he was buried two days before he was supposed to be married, and he's with the Lord. He loves the Lord. He knows different now. But I tell you, dear people, you're going to ha somebody's going to have to stand. And re no matter if you stand against the, the every everyone else, stand. Don't don't get obnoxious. Don't argue. There's no no uh, sense to, uh, in, in arguing. But nevertheless, that's where the New American Standard uh, stands in connection with the authorized version. Now, let me, uh, I just jotted these down quickly to, to show you just what these many versions, paraphrases, and translations are doing. They cause, first, they cause widespread confusion, because everywhere we go, people say, what do you think of this, what do you think of this, what do you think of this? Well, what do young people think when they hear all of that? Two, they discourage memorization. Who's going to memorize when each one has a different Bible, different translation? They obviate the use of the concordance. Where are you going to find a concordance for good news for a modern man or any of these others? You're going to find one. You're going to have to have a concordance for everyone? Well, you'd have a lot of concordances. Four, they provide opportunity for perverting the truth. It makes a marvelous, with all of these translation versions, each one trying to get a little different slant from the others. Make a difference. If it isn't different, why, why get? Why, why have a new effort? Marvelous opportunity for the devil to slip in uh, his perverting influence. Five, these many translations make teaching of the Bible difficult, and I'm finding that more and more as I go around the country. I mentioned this thing the other night, but how could a mathematics professor or instructor teach a certain particular problem in a class if the class had about six or eight different textbooks. How about that? Where, where are some of these teachers? Where's Sister Aline? Are you in here? I thought I saw you. So there you are. Yeah, how, how could you do it? How could you do it? Well, they elicit profitless argu or argumentation because everywhere we go, they say, well, now this one is more accurate. Well, what, which is much more accurate? How do they know? And this is no reflection because I would have done press a few years ago. In, in, in the Christian Light magazine, I got this. My dear friend, Dr. George Sweeting, President of Moody Bible Institute, one of the sweetest, dearest men you ever met. He's wonderfully named. It's going to be starting today down right near my home at uh, Southern Keswick. If I'm back by the end of the week, I expect to see him. I'm going to talk to you about these things. When he was asked for his recommendation of the New American Standard, he said, I like it because it reads freely. You read it yourself. It's, it's in the ads in various magazines, and he said, I particularly like it because it's so near to the original. I'm going to say, now, George, what is the original? Have you ever seen it? There isn't any original. There isn't any original. Some will say, well, where did Erasmus uh, get his manuscripts? Well, let me tell you something. He didn't have to have any manuscripts. He did, but he didn't have... Where, where did Moses get his manuscripts? He didn't have any. Holy men of old were born along by the Holy Ghost as God Almighty transmitted his word to men. Peter and Paul didn't have any manuscripts. God spoke to them, and God could have spoken to Erasmus even without a manuscript, but he had manuscripts, and he knew them. Oh, uh, lest I forget it before I read these others, and one of these questions here, somebody says, how can we know we have the whole truth? Well, uh, just simply by believing God. And what do I mean by that? Uh, John 16, 13, When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into how much? Tell me. Tell me now. All. And if we don't have all truth, the Holy Spirit isn't doing his work. We have to have all truth for him to lead us into all truth. And there are many, many other did I say that a little loudly? <sighs> Again, the many, many versions incur an enormous waste of the Lord's money. I have commented on that just a little earlier. Just one in two years bringing in $22 million. That could have sent a lot of missionaries out. And then this, let's not forget, there are just so many facets, so many aspects of this. Everywhere we go, people say, and this is exactly what my good friend Ken Taylor said when he got out the, 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 the Living Bible, said he found that his children couldn't understand the authorized version very well, but could understand if he stepped it down for them. Well, I want to tell you something. Up until recent years, till the devil started stirring up the atmosphere, nobody seemed to have any trouble understanding God's Word who was born again. Why? Because... 
You've heard this 101 times. Would you let me make it 102 times? The Bible is the only textbook. Now get this. The Bible is the only textbook that has the author present every time it's studied. Why, Robert Murray McChain, just a young man, died at 29. And uh, Sister Arlene, he, he, he uh, gave vent to a lot of Latin, when he, sometimes Greek, when he wanted to say something. Why, he just, just poured out his heart in some other language. I mean, not, not an unknown language. Such as, let me see if I can bring up one. Uh, and there he was troubled about himself, and he heard, heard a preacher exalting the Lord Jesus, and he said, uh, let me see if I could get to... Would you go out just for a minute, Sister Arlene? I don't want a Latin teacher here. Something like this. Uh, o quam humilium, uh, said uh, Dilla Gentissimum, Oh, how humble and yet how energetic, you know. And then he, he, he listened to him a little further out of his heart. He said, uh, Oh, quam dejectum, said Wagillum. Uh, so self-effacing and yet so vigilant, so, so alert. And then, then he said to himself, as he thought of his heart, he says, Non pecum hobbit, my heart has no peace. Where, why? Picatum apwood forays mainet sin lieth at my door. And then he said, what's the word for help? J-U-V-A, how do you pronounce that? Do you pronounce the, the J? But at any rate, he cried out, help, uh, pater, fili, et spiritus. Help, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You see, people who knew the Holy Spirit, knew God, uh, they, they would say, well, Lord, you can lead me into your truth. The, the great difficulty is we're trying to compensate for it. We don't know the Holy Spirit as we should. We don't know our teacher. We're not hearing. If we could hear his voice, we would have no trouble learning his word from the authorized version. And let me tell you this. You may not be able to answer the arguments, and you won't be. I can't answer them either. Some of these university and seminary professors that come along and say, what about this, what about this? And they go into areas that I haven't even had time to get in. As I said to you a couple minutes ago, you, can do, you, you don't need to defend yourself. You don't need to defend God's Word. You don't, de, don't defend it. You don't need to defend it. You don't need to apologize for it. Just say, well, did this version or this translation come down through the Roman scream? If so, count me out. Whatever you say about Erasmus and Tyndale, that's what I want because it's given me... The, and besides, we've had this for 360-some years. It's been tested as no other piece of literature has ever been tested, word by word, syllable by syllable, and think even as of this moment, no one has found anything wrong with doctrine in it. And that's the main thing, you know. He that wills to do the will of God shall know the doctrine or the teaching. Well, where are we? I guess, we're, oh, time's up. We don't have much of an inter interim here. I didn't get around to very much because this, the preponderantly the questions had to do with the versions and so on. Let, let's be people of the book. And it's got, it, it took my mother to heaven, my dad, my grandfather, my grandmother. It, it was Moody's book. It was Livingstone's book. J.C. Studd gave up his fortune to take this book to Africa. And I don't feel ashamed to carry it the rest of my journey. God's book. Our Father, we thank thee and praise thee for thy word. Help us to love it and preach it and teach it and tell everybody we can the good news through thy word. In Jesus' name, amen.